So it begins. Here I am with the first part, and I'm just making some adjustments in the camera. The camera's on a tripod. First beginning of the construction of the K2, this is the control board. I have inventoried the whole radio, not missing any parts. I did say that I was going to get a camera to hook to my computer so I can see what I'm doing on screen in the on the right computer screen. I haven't done that yet. Because I belong to a number of email reflectors on the internet and there is a rumor which we hope is just a vicious rumor. Well it's not really a rumor. What happened is uh, Elecraft has discontinued their K1 which was their smaller QRP radio and some people are speculating that perhaps perhaps they would eventually be discontinuing the K2. I don't know how many of them they sell. Uh, this is my ground strap by the way because there's there's transistors and ICs in here that I don't want to get um, static electricity on. Uh, no indication from Elecraft that they're doing that at all. I don't want to start any rumors but uh, just in case I did, and I, and I was going to do it anyway, I went ahead and I bought the uh, single sideband module for this. I ordered it. It's not here yet. And I also ordered the computer interface where you can plug it into a, well it's got a 9 pin outlet. You can put a USB uh, prolific, it's called a prolific driver, USB connector to your uh, computer and you can control your radio with software, do logging and all that good stuff, and digital modes, which I eventually will do. So I bought those two modules and that was uh, it was a little bit of more money. So I didn't buy the camera. Long story short, I did not buy the camera yet. I'm going to be getting a camera eventually um, that hooks to the computer and hopefully has a wider angle view. It's a, The one I'm looking at is used uh, by um, Randy K7AGE who does a lot of very popular ham radio videos he's got one and they're only about 60 bucks they're not terribly expensive and they're made by uh, Logitech I forget them all but eventually I'll get it so I did actually count every single part in this radio every capacitor every resistor I had them all out counted them all was not missing any parts. They tell you to do that to inventory the parts. It took uh, three, four hours at least, at least, because you have. I have to use a magnifying glass to read the numbers on most of these. So what I'm doing now is just laying out the parts. These are the control board parts. I'm going to do this video, uh, A.K.A. Jim Lindenist style, <laughs> if you will, where he just lets the lets the the camera go and whatever ends up on the video ends up on the video. He doesn't do a lot of editing. I'll do a little maybe. So these will be long. Building this radio is going to be long. I there, As far as I can tell, I have searched YouTube. Nobody, surprisingly, maybe people figure it would be boring. I don't know. Nobody has done a video series on building one of these. There's a couple guys, and I think I've mentioned this before, sip of coffee. There's a couple guys that have done partial videos. They showed some of the stuff they did. There's a couple videos where they just show them powering up. Some of them just show pictures of the radio. But none of them show anybody actually building one of these on video. And I don't know if anybody's going to really watch this for hours and hours of building this radio because I expect it to take upwards of 30 hours to build the whole radio. That's generally what uh, people say. I don't know that I'll videotape every single thing I do. Probably not. There's a lot of toroids in this. Those are these little donut shaped things that you got to wrap wires around. It makes, um, they make transformers and filters and inductors. They're very tedious, time consuming to wrap the wires around these things. I know that's one thing I'm not going to tape. You can buy pre-wound pre ones from Elcraft. I want to have the experience of 
building this radio myself, so I am not going to pre-order them. I, maybe I'll tape one, you know, uh, an easier one, so you, people can see what's being done with them. Um, but I'm not going to videotape every single one, because it's going to take a long time to do it. So basically what I'm doing here is just laying out the parts so I can easily see them. These are, this is the bag of parts for the control board, which is the first thing we're putting together. It is the front panel of the radio, basically. And it includes some ICs and transistors, so I have this grounding strap on, which is uh, grounded to my light, actually, which is a steel light. So I don't discharge static electricity into one of these ICs and destroy it. I want to get a proper mat. They make these blue anti-static mats with, with the ground strap. Um, and they have nice ones online that I eventually want to get, but I want to get a lot of things. But I have to prioritize. Like I said, I had to made the decision to buy those modules while they were available. Not, not again, not that Elcraft's discontinuing them, but I want to have all the modules. The only other ones I'm going to want to get, maybe, and I haven't totally decided yet, is I want to get the automatic antenna tuner, which installs into this. Um, I think that's it. There's one more. Oh yeah, there's a there's a 160 meter module. It adds 160 meter coils. There's also a 60 meter one. I don't know if I'd ever use 60 meters. I might. It's a newer band for those of you who are not ham radio guys and don't know. It's been allocated for the last, I don't know, five to ten years. I, I'm not even sure. And um, it's channelized. Uh, you can only transmit on certain frequencies, almost like CB, and you can only use the equivalent output, peak envelope output or what, what have you, um, of a 100 watts on a dipole. You can use a different type of antenna, but if it has gain, like a beam, you have to crank down your power so you are not putting out more than the equivalent of 100 watts on a dipole. Now how you calculate that I'm not sure. I don't have a beam so I don't I don't know that stuff but I don't know. I've never been on 60 meters. The radio I sold, the IC7100 had 60 meters in it. Never used it. So I don't know that I'll get the 60 meter module. I might. The 160 I do want to get now 160 you need a big antenna for, or a big long wire, but uh, I may use it portable, you never know. Uh, the, other, the other nice thing, if you get the 160 module for this, you get an extra antenna input. So you can put, um, you can actually have like two receive antennas, and you can switch from one to the other. So if you have di different dipoles for different bands cut, you're uh, good to go. Okay, so there we have our layout. Now, careful not to bounce the pan, right? So this little uh, holder here is a PCB holder I picked up from a Hendrix radio uh, probably 10 years ago almost. Um, he has since retired, I believe, and these are not made anymore, and I'm glad I have it. It's an aluminum uh, PCB clamp, and you can spin your thing on it. So you can flip over to solder and flip it back to put your component in. So I can't get everything on camera with the way I'm set up right now. So I'm actually going to be reading through the manual and doing each part one at a time as we go. Uh, so this is the control board, the front of the board. The um, top is silk screened nicely. There are a couple things that go on the bottom of it eventually. We'll get to that. So this is actually the face plate of the radio goes over the top of this, and it, 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 it's in the front of the radio. So this is the size of the front of the radio, the, uh, the control board. Okay, the side of the control board, and I am building this as 
a hobbyist. I'm doing this for my own enjoyment. I'm doing this to more or less for posterity category, uh, catalog my experience of building this uh, on video. And I'm not a professional. I do not do electronics other than as a hobbyist. And uh, this is not a how-to video. It's how I am building it. It's a how, not a how-to, how, how I'm building it. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. So I'll make mistakes. The side of the control board with most components is the top side. The top side, blah, 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 facing you with a notch on the lower left, where my thumb is. Locate and position resistor R5 near the left edge. The label R5 appears below the resistor's outline. And I'm, I'm reading this because I want you to see or hear how good this manual is. By the way, R5 is right at my thumb. Install a 33K resistor orange, orange, orange at R5 with the orange bands at the top and the gold band indicating 5% tolerance at the bottom. Make sure it is seated flush with the board, then bend the leads to the bottom to hold it in place. Do not solder this resistor until the remaining fixed resistors have been installed in the next step. Uh, when they say towards the top, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting that as being this is the top edge and this is the bottom edge because this is the control panel and the nomenclature is written left to right, top to bottom. So that's, and building that way makes no difference with a resistor. A resistor can go either way. They're not directional in any way, shape, or form. It's simply a matter of convention that you have your tolerance stripes all facing in the same direction. So that if somebody comes in later on and looks at this board, it's neat and they can find these resistors and read them easily uh, for what colors they are. Um, and I am using a magnifying glass. These are really tiny quarter watt resistors. I wear glasses, do not have the best uh, vision at 50 years of age and um, need a magnifying glass. I have a Bosch & Lomb 10X loop too that was my grandfather's. Uh, he worked for Bosch & Lomb. This is cool. It's a uh, Bosch & Lomb of op Optical Company, Rochester, New York, USA. 10X. And th this is a really nice loop. It's a glass loop from probably the 60s. He died in 69. He died when I was two and a half. My mother said I he was my favorite and I was his favorite and I was with him all the time, but I unfortunately do not remember him. I only have pictures of him. So <laughs> it was fun trying to uh, inventory these. They mount these in strips according to the way they are installed in the manual. I mean, and, and I'm illustrating this because this is what makes the Elecraft such a great company and their kits so good. And this is what made Heathkit good. Their instruction manual is extremely clear step by step. And I'm pointing this out because a lot of people hesitate to build a radio like this because they say, well, it's too complicated. I've never done anything that complex. I'm afraid to do it. They make it easy. Um, not that you couldn't make a mistake, but they make it easy. Um, and the manual and the way they do these parts is extremely helpful. So my first resistor is to the left and it's the orange, orange, gray, orange, orange, gold. The gold is my tolerance. They're three orange, which is a 33K resistor. Another thing you can do, which I, well, I could do, but I, I don't have it out, is I have sometimes gotten my multimeter out and popped them on these resistors just to make sure I have the right resistor. Um, if the colors are hard to read, that can be helpful. So I'm going to use my little flat nose to bend my leads down. I think it said gold to the bottom. Gold band at the bottom. Yes, it did. So yeah, I know this isn't very exciting, but putting resistors in is not difficult. Through hole parts are, that's what makes this buildable. It's not surface mount. There are a couple parts that became obsolete over the years. This radio first came out in 2000. This is one of them. This is a little um, surface mount uh, IC chip on a miniature uh, PCB board with holes in it. And you actually put little wires in there 
on the eight holes because the originally this had an eight pin IC and they're no longer available. So they had to go to the surface mount thing uh, to replace it. And there's a couple of these in this radio. I don't see where this goes off the top of my head, but um, I believe it goes on this board somewhere. Anyway, I'm not doing that step. Moving on. Install the remaining fixed resistors, which are listed below, left to right, on the PC bo board order. The resistors should all be oriented with their first significant digit band toward the left or the top. That means the gold tolerance band at the bottom. This will make the color codes easier to read if you need to recheck values after installation. Check 1% resistors with an ohm meter. Because the reason they tell you that, and, and it's like I just mentioned, the colors are hard to read. The 1% ones have five colors, and they're blue, and they're very hard to see the colors on. Uh, and they're the blue ones, if you can see those at all. When multiple items appear on one line in a component list, such as the one below, complete all the items on one line before moving to the next, as indicated by the small arrow. In other words, install R5 first, then R2, then go to the second line. So you're basically, and you can't see this, you're reading left to right, top to bottom. This list here. So I'm going to put all these resistors in. I don't think they are I forgot what I was going to say. And then you check off each one as we go. So where's my little pen? R3 is there. R5 is a 33K. Next is R2, which is a 3.3 mega ohm. Uh, R2. And that one should be orange, orange green. And it is. Oh, I was listening to uh, 20 meters before I turned the camera on, on the SP600, and it's a contest weekend. So, there's a lot of people on 20 meters right now, if you're interested in listening. Uh, yeah, except this video is going to probably be posted after. Today is Saturday. Uh, October 7th, by the way. I don't know if I'll get this video up right away. I'm going to try to upload these as I do them. 3.3 uh, make orange, orange, green. So I'm going to do this first group of five and then flip them and, and solder them. Actually, I'm, well, it depends on where R3 is. R3 is next. R3 is right there, yeah, as long as they're close together. If I get spread out on the board, I'm going to solder those before I move on. Brown, black, orange. Brown, black, orange is R3. That's a 10K. I don't know. Gold at the bottom. That anybody's going to actually want to sit and watch me solder in resistors. What makes some of the other videos more watchable, like Jim Lindenus and others, is their troubleshooting, and it's kind of interesting to follow along. Green, blue, red is R4. Left to right, top to bottom, R4. There's 21. Oh, they're right here. Right in a row. 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Where's 4, though? 4 and 5, actually. 5 is the first one I did. Oh, that's right. It said it didn't go in order. R4 is the next one, though. And then R6, which is right there. 5, 2, 3, 6. Sixteen, seventeen, 
21. 20 can't be way over there. Or 4, there it is. Yeah, these four, I can do them all at once, so. 5.6, green, blue, red. You'd almost think that was orange, but it's green, blue, red. I can see these pretty good with a magnifying glass, so I'm not going to throw them on my multimeter. I may throw the blue ones on, though. Although, they're in the order that you're installing them, and they tell you right on there which one you're installing next. So It's probably not necessary. R4, 5.6K, green, blue, red is R4. Green, blue, red, R4. Part of my goal with this video, though, is to encourage the hobby of electronics and ham radio. And just by posting these, R6, brown, black, brown, I'm hoping, even though it might be boring to sit and watch the whole thing, and you can certainly fast forward all this, to further the idea in people's minds that this is not as hard as it looks. Brown, black, brown, double check, triple check, brown, black, brown. That is R6. R6 is right there, okay. Oh, I didn't turn the soldering iron on. It's, uh, that'll just take a minute to heat up, but now you get to see how nice this, uh, my little board holder works. What I do is simply loosen this and rotate. Now these have to be kept from falling out, so you simply bend the leads out so they don't fall through when you flip it. And there you go, Bob your uncle. And then we tighten. Hopefully, well, I was going to say hopefully they'll be close enough to the board. They, they do tend, when you bend them like that, and they, they, the gravity obviously pulls them backwards toward the ground again. Um, now they, too, uh, they, um, they tell you in the instructions for this, to use about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm, I'm at 680. I've been using 680 actually for a while. It's one of the presets on this particular. I have a digital, you can't see the control part of this thing. It's a, it's a Radio Shack digital uh, soldering iron. The, um, I have found this to be a good temperature, 680 for working on just general stuff like big radios. I probably shouldn't be doing this with these parts here. And I haven't felt, found that I've needed more than that. Now resistors aren't a big deal, um, but you can damage, you can damage uh, some parts with too much heat. You have to be careful. Generally, like IC chips, um, transistors, some capacitors, depends on what kind they are. I think ceramics are pretty okay to have a fair amount of heat on. Um, some of the, is it polyethylene? I can't think of the one. There's one in particular that I've used, and they're generally a low value in the peak of Farad range. They're not mica either. And they tell you on those not to use too much heat in the in the data sheet. Can't remember what they are. Anyway, 680s working just fine. I have a very thin uh, pointy tip on this. 
conical tip. When I'm working on tube stuff, I'm using a uh, chisel tip because you're working on these big um, big leads and stuff that you're soldering. You need more heat transfer usually. My solder is Kester 6040 with real lead. I don't like the fake lead ones. They make solder now that's lead free and I'm not crazy about it. And actually Helicraft tells you, recommends I should say, this particular solder. This is also very thin so I don't get too much going on here. This is a, what is it, 0 0.02 of an inch which is like 0 0.05 of a millimeter or something like that. I forget exactly. But it's a very thin um, solder. Actually, let me read it to you. It's, uh, where is it? 0.5 millimeter. Yep. I knew it said millimeter somewhere. That translates to like 0 0.02 of an inch when you purchase it. When you, uh, Elcraft tells you 0 0.02 on their soldering tips on their website. And I'm just checking behind these just to make sure I'm fairly close to the board. Not hanging down too low. These two, well, I guess they're alright. They warranty these radios, believe it or not, even though people are building them. They do give you a one year warranty and uh, free replacement of any parts that are missing and I have heard from people that have built them and contacted them uh, mainly on email lists that uh, they will give you if you damage a part they'll give you a new one for free they're an excellent company to work with and highly recommended and the um, the other thing is if you have a problem with your radio you know they have they have great technical assistance. You can call them, you can email them directly to their support, and you'll get answers right away from them. Uh, however, if it's something that they cannot assist you in troubleshooting over the phone or by email, talk you through more or less, one, one of the engineers, they will let you return a radio to them. And I think I think you probably pay shipping. I don't know. I don't know that they pay shipping, but they will troubleshoot and repair it for free. As long as, and, and I'm, I'm coming full circle to the fact that that's why they tell you to use this solder. Because I guess some people have used really lousy solder on these in the past and they've had, you know, obvious issues with the build not working out and the radio not working right and it came down to bad, bad soldering and bad uh, connections and sometimes from the use of plumber solder they actually the one and I, I don't doubt it happens um, within the book it tells you you know make sure it's you know rosin free no, uh, this has flux in it but the the, the plumber solder I forget what it's, it's I don't know if it's rosin or what the heck it's got acid in it it's acid free Make sure your solder is acid from rosin free or something because the solder stuff with the acid in it, you know, it etches the copper pipes, you know, when you're installing them. It <laughs> plays havoc on electronics. It's not made for electronics. Don't use plumber solder. Alright, I think we're good there. What I like to do then is check my work, which you can't see because I don't have a close-up camera yet with the magnifying glass. And about all I can see is little little divots. Welcome back. Set up the uh, 
multimeter. The next four resistors are the 1% tolerant ones with five bands of color. So I thought I'm just going to go ahead and do what they ask and uh, put the multimeter across them. So let's do that. And I don't know. I'll look through my lens. Yeah, you can see the number, I hope. Yeah. It's showing up. Okay. First one is R7. It is a 1.78K brown, violet, gray, brown. Yeah. The, the gray on a blue background looks yellow. That's why they, they tell you to check these with a the multimeter. Even though they, them, and that's the thing, I mean, human beings put these on these strips and that's why they tell you to double check. They can make mistakes there too. And uh, 1.76, that's pretty good. 1.77, all right. The next one is, and they should be in order, this should be on a 100 ohm. Brown, black, black, black. One hundred and one. Very good. The next should be eight hundred and six K. Eight hundred and twelve. That's good. And there's an M after that, so it's point eight eleven, point eight twelve, which is eight hundred and ten thousand. The next one. 196k right on the money so those are the next three they are in the right order on this strip as packaged by Elecraft and we can go ahead and uh, place them I moved my part box as you can see I don't know why I was working over it before just because I had set it up quickly and uh, set up the camera and I wasn't really thinking. So one at a time, here we go. First one is number R7, it's a 1.78K. We have verified that. We bend our leads over. Now these don't have gold. They have like brown as the tolerance. One, two, three, four. Uh, brown. Yeah. The t I, don't, I don't know if it's supposed to be brown, but the tolerance thing is, looks, it looks like brown. It's probably, it's probably gold. Or, I don't know what 1% would be. Gold is 5%. R7, and these are right in a row. R7, R8 is our 100. And you can, I mean, these are thin leads. You can bend these by hand very easily. But if you want a nice right angle, you should use a pair of duckbill. You can also bend these on the edge of a credit card. I've done that. Works quite well. So how I'm putting these is I'm uh, in keeping with the convention uh, of the tolerance at the top. Brown, black, black, black. I am putting the way we're reading them from the bottom to the top. And whatever that tolerance color is. Yeah, I had that one upside down. The one before it. And next is a 806K. To me, to be able to put a radio this sophisticated, I guess I could say, is a modern, uh, really good, and these things are known for being very good receivers. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop talking a minute. 806K, gray, black, blue, orange. Gray, black, blue, orange. And yeah, the tolerance ring, I guess, is brown. They look brown. I don't know what it's supposed to be. 
But it amazes me that they anybody can build this, you know, and I really believe that. If you have just a general understanding of radio, I mean, and you can just plug circuit these in and solder them without even understanding how all the radio works. Um, there is information in the back of this manual that at some point I will be showing that gives you the block diagram and how it works. Brown, white, blue, orange. And I plan on, and I already have, I've already looked at that in detail, and it has all the schematics, all that stuff. I plan on trying to understand how this radio works as I'm building it. I'm always trying to learn more about electronics and just this is more mechanical than electrical. It's not having to understand what you're doing. Other, If you can follow the instructions you can solder these in. But uh, I want to have an understanding of it. I listened to a podcast called Solder Smoke, and if you're unfamiliar with it, it's on uh, it's on the internet. You can search Solder Smoke podcast. You will find it. They have a website. You can pay it play directly off there. I listen to it on my iPhone, driving to work. And Bill on there and Pete are both uh, home brewer guys. They build their own radios and they promote home brewing and building your own radios. And I would recommend it because Pete himself. Uh, Bill is just a very knowledgeable ham. I don't think he's an electrical engineer from what I understand. I'm not sure what he does for a living, but Pete is an electrical engineer. Extremely knowledgeable. Uh, not that Bill is any schlep, because he's not. He's extremely, he knows a lot more than I do. But Bill kind of defers to Pete sometimes in the technical department. Pete gives him suggestions on how to do things sometimes. And, but he, they build their own radios and, you know, they're, they also do kits. They promote the BitX40. The BitX40 is uh, a radio designed and built by a gentleman named Farhan. That's his last name. Everybody just calls him Farhan. His first name is... Uh, starts with an A. I can't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to mess it up. His last name is Farhan. And he, um, designed and put these kits together. And it's kind of a cottage industry in India. He lives in a poor country. And he's, you know, although they're getting more, much more progressive than they were years ago. But they're still generally a poor country. And he employs um, women to help supplement their income by putting these kits together and selling them to ham radio guys all over the world. And they've become quite popular because they're only $59. $59. They're shipped from India. I, I forget. The shipping is not much. You can you can get it shipped over here fairly cheap. I have one. I haven't built it yet. I haven't talked about it. I'm bringing this up because Farhan, Bill on Sutter Smoke Sot Podcast, is a big fan of him because Farhan is a guy that is a home brewer. He builds his own stuff and uh, builds his own test equipment. All kinds of stuff. But if you want to learn about electronics, that's a good resource. It's a good podcast. They, uh, they're they fun to listen to. Also, they make it fun and interesting. More interesting than me. And they do it about once a month. 
there's about 190 some, they're almost up to 200 now I think, they might even be to 200 episodes, and I'm actually working my way backwards through them. I started at the end with the 190 something, when I, I only started listening to it about two months ago, and uh, I'm working back through them. You can download them all in the uh, podcast app that's on an iPhone, they're all, they're all in there. Just search Out of Smoke. And I'm working my way through every episode. And I'm learning a ton, and it's gotten me interested in home brewing and building radios, and where you actually design and build a radio on a breadboard. Um, going beyond just building a kit like this that somebody else has designed. I don't feel that I could do it now as far as the design work, but what I'm going to do, that looks pretty good. Those are at a good level. I, I, bent, I bent the leads more on the back so they wouldn't fall through, and we're looking good. And I'm checking this side because, it's, as I said, it's a double sided uh, circuit board. So when I add the solder to the other side, it, it wicks right through to this side. And you should have just a little bit of a shiny um, dimple on this side of the solder board as well as the other side. And I do. I look good. You don't want to have a cold solder joint, which what happens there is you don't have the lead on the component, in this case a resistor, hot enough. And the solder melts to the pad, but it doesn't stick to the component. And it leaves like a, almost like a tunnel through the solder and you end up with a bad connection and it can be intermittent so it can be drive you crazy when it happens because sometimes it'll make contact and then if you get a little vibration or movement on your circuit board it will make it'll lose contact and you it, to hit to be able to so you're always good to go back and look at your connections with a magnifying glass and just to make sure you have nice shiny little dimples that don't have divots in them. And the other sign of a cold solder joint is the solder will not be shiny. It'll have a haze to it. It becomes shinier when it's properly heated to the right temperature and it, and it adheres to the metal. So there we go. We have our first two groups of resistors. I will now check those off. And I want to show a book real quick because this was on the Solder Smoke web uh, podcast. They had Farhan visit Bill's. He came over to the United States and he visited a lot of people and he visited Bill, the guy from Solder Smoke. And I listened to Farhan on a couple other podcasts where people interviewed him. And both Farhan and Bill and Pete all recommend this book. And I would highly recommend this book too. You can get this directly from the ARRL. If you search for this book on Amazon, it's very overpriced. Don't buy it. 50 bucks, it's a reprint directly from the ARRL. They do pay, you pay a little more for shipping, but the, you know, I, I, and I have Amazon Prime for the free shipping, but you can't get it for 50 bucks on Amazon. They're, they're selling used copies of this on Amazon, which is the first edition, before it was reprinted, and they want like a ridiculous amount of money for it. Um, this is Experimental Methods in RF Design by Wes Hayward, Rick Campbell, and Bob Larkin. Um, Farhan Luz used this book to help him design the BitX40. It's an extremely in-depth book on building homebrew radios, transmitters, receivers, all kinds of stuff, many different types of circuits. And they recommend to build as a first project a direct conversion receiver. And that is what I'm going to do. And this is the block diagram of the direct conversion receiver, which just shows how it works. And they give you the schematic on the next page and there it is built and you can follow this book start building your own circuits just by looking at a schematic getting your own components and learn about how radio works and learn about how electronics works and just 
even if you're not a ham radio operator, it makes no difference. You don't have to transmit. You can build receivers and have a lot of fun and learn a ton about radio that you'll never learn uh, just troubleshooting and fixing old radios. Uh, although you will be using modern parts. You're not going to be using tube stuff in these. It's all modern parts. And this book is extremely extensive. That I have only started it. I've read the first chapter and a half. And uh, it goes into many different types of things you can build. Tons of information on electronics in general. There's this how to use an oscilloscope. All kinds of stuff. And then in the back, in the back, which you won't get if you get a used copy on Amazon, or probably, the CD has two more books in it, built, written by Russ Hayward. Um, Solid State Design, and another one, I can't think of the name of the other one, in a PDF format. And they are a little older than this book, but they go into the same thing. It's all homebrew, building your own radios, and understanding electronics. Tons and tons of information in here. Uh, running mobile with uh, this this is a tent and that's this uh, a lot of guys do this that's one of the reasons I'm building this radio the K2 it can be used mobile you can put a battery in it or you can use an external battery pack you can hook it up to the battery itself you can get a rechargeable battery pack and hook it up to solar panels that was a solar panel that's what I neglected to say oh yeah here's an audio audio uh, filters, it tells you how to... It takes you through each section of the radio, how to build an audio output filter, how to build a passband filter, um, how to build uh, an amplifier. All the different components of a radio are in each chapter. And excellent book. Highly recommend it. I'll stop there for now again and say 73. I think I'm going to put these two video clips together and put this up as my first building video. I hope to improve the camera work, as I said, in future episodes. But uh, yes, I jumped ahead. I said I was going to finish my daughter's radio. I have not. I stripped and refinished a table for her that she really wanted. Uh, that was my stepfather's, her grandfather's. And he died uh, 10 years ago. And he was a carpenter, and she's always wanted this table. So instead of working on that radio before I went and visited her, I abandoned that. I didn't abandon it. I set it aside, and I stripped and refinished this table for her that she really wanted. And she was absolutely thrilled to have it. And I know she'd appreciate that more than radio. I'm the one that's into radio. So yes, I skipped ahead. I'm not working on that Emerson right now. Instead, I'm starting to build the K2. Eventually, I'll get back to that and build it um, and take it back out to her in the spring because I, I actually won't see her again till springtime, more than likely. But I will talk to her, but I won't get out to see her. So, 73, this is Tom uh, with our first installment of the K2 build. Thanks for watching.